Okay, he will tell. Oh, live. No, it's live. No, I think. Yeah. No. Yeah, we are. Are we live? Yes, yes, Ravin. Yes. We can see up there. We are live. <laughs> lovely, lovely. <laughs> All right. So uh, obviously today is the first day of the second lockdown in India. Um, so let's spend uh, spend it wisely. The next forty five minutes to an hour, talk about the future of digital payments in India. Specifically, we'll talk about B two B payments and open banking, um, since those are fairly hot. So welcome to the live blog broadcast um, of a session that I've been looking forward to moderate. Uh, from my apartment uh, in Bangalore, uh, very excited to have a diverse uh, panel to discuss. Um, well, not another session on COVID, thank God. But today we're discussing the future of digital payments. To help navigate this, we have three esteemed individuals who will tell us what they are seeing through their crystal ball and very unique crystal ball. My first panelist is uh, Ram. Ram, hello. Um, hey. A thought leader in financial services, public policy, and payments. He spent over 20 years working in top positions in financial services firms and has seen the evolution of this ecosystem in India. Welcome to the show, Ram. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Yeah. My second panelist is Bhushan Patel, uh, my partner at Multiply Hi. Venture. Um, he spent his last 20 years in operations roles in both China and in India um, with the uh, Behumas like Alibaba, and uh, the last five years he was the president of Paytm. He has really seen the growth of Paytm when there were less than 100 million to now over 400 million customers. Um, looking forward to you know getting his perspective from a venture capitalist. Thanks, Bhushan. Sure. No, thanks. thanks. My third panelist is Vishal, um, the CEO of Hilo. So he's going to give us an entrepreneur's perspective of this. Uh, he has spent over 15 years in senior roles in companies like uh, Talisma, Maverick, and Empower. At Hilo, Vishal and his team uh, are at the forefront of building B2B payment solutions, helping SMEs and micro SMEs move to non-cash payments. Again, a big focus for the government too. So without further ado, let's go crystal gazing and get started with this, ses with this session, Future of Payments in India, specifically, like I said, B2B payments and open banking. Now, just to the audience, um, and we have a fair number. Um, have you stopped ever to think about how you pay for chai or your drink or groceries that you buy? You know, simply scanning a QR code and your phone uh, on your phone and making a payment to your local grocer or a restaurant near you. If you haven't, then take a moment to think about this. All of this has been enabled in India in the last two and a half to three years by a revolution spearheaded by the NPCI. UPI, or what we all popularly, uh, you know, startup circles call the wallet killer, has been in the center of this revolution. Today, we've ha we have over 1.5 trillion rupees worth of transactions every month going through this payment infrastructure. And the aim, of course, is by 2023 to have more non-cash transactions uh, than cash transactions. And obviously, for this to happen, uh, and this is actually part of the topic that we're going to talk about, because for this to happen, a really important thing that needs to happen is SMEs and micro SMEs need to get on this bandwagon. So my my first question uh, is to Ram. You know, so Ram, I, like I said, over the last few years has been very closely associated or involved with changes in this ecosystem, working very closely with VCs, startups and regulators. For those who aren't familiar, Ram was with MPCI and part of the team that worked on INPS, UPI, and in general real-time payments. So in your opinion, Ram, what needs to be done in terms of regulation, infrastructure, reach, usability to help these SMEs and micro SMEs make this transition to digital payments? Uh, thank you, Ravin. Uh, before I take you to this uh, answer to this question, I will take you about that. What has happened today on the digital payment side? A little bit, you know, in the pessimistic way, like uh, we we have five hundred uh, billion dollars digital payments happening in the country as of now. But the uh, flip side is that only one hundred thirty million people are unique users. They have used this in once in a lifetime, uh, and the entire. So still you have, if you talk about your 135, 1.35 billion population, 
and about 360 million uh, millennials 460 million uh, billion million phones then it is just peanut you know perhaps you know uh, even the p2p segment and b2 b2c segment we have not done enough if you talk about further about the sme side we have 51 million uh, smes doing transactions worth a trillion dollar as of now but how much has been digitized whatever way at the mundane way or legacy way is hardly 300 million so that 700 million is a delta which is available to us and fintech can play a very vital role because the smes are today getting only the credit side from the bank banks are not able to fulfill their demand about the transaction management transaction and when i talk about transaction management this is happening your their expense management or their invoice management or their uh, receivables and credit uh, creditors management system and where they require a software as a service at saas people who can really contribute as of now it's hardly 8000 fintech in the area of digital payments but the good part is that the vcs have recognized the importance of b2b segment and that's why in 2019 they have invested about 657 billion million dollars as against 617 million dollars for the business b2c area that means b2c area is now drying out the big opportunity is coming in the b2b side now what is happening today the banks because of the legacy infrastructure and their various other shortcomings cannot go and create a network effect for creating a network you know, particularly you know either you go to the logistic side because if my my creditor becomes a receivables to somebody else so if you do this kind of value chain perhaps the invoice uh, management plays a very vital role and the second thing is that the uh, in the reserve bank of india is trying to regulate fintech what what do you mean by regulating the fintech that they'll be at par with the banking side you know so you as a fintech you you get a connectivity or or, or you can use the infra that the banks are using so it will be a kind of uh, uh, at par uh, mm-hmm. it's a level playing field for you so get ready uh, fintech and see to it that how this sme sector which is about uh, growing at the rate of 39% and is a part of 40% gdp you can harness and you can provide them some easy solutions you know which is secure safe seamless and make uh, in uh, and touching to their own requirement yeah no that's a great point ram because you know one of the things that covid has done is i think a lot of people have realized the importance of you know smes and micro smes even when you talk about kirana stores and and all of these right so i think you know the opportunity is only going to get bigger um and the other thing you talked about obviously was network effect uh, i would love to hear from vishal you know given that he's you know building a solution from you know smes and micro smes um, you know how does he think about go to market and um, and specifically you know how do you create this network effect yeah so so i guess uh, ravin on the network effect uh, what we have seen over the past number of years especially in the past 3 to 5 years uh, thanks to the financial highway the whole infrastructure available in india today where in uh, the payments infrastructure especially it has become a seamless infrastructure so especially when i am talking of the b2c transactions or in other words we use the terms p2p transactions and to some point i guess even the merchant payments and stuff so so it has arrived a point today wherein we don't really have to worry about uh, what tool are we going to use what application we are going to use so there are five different options uh so it's it's basically you know five different tools five different apps and 20 different banks and 10 different wallets they are all connected they are all on a single network and that is what india has done and to a great degree npci has been the part of building the uh, imps rupee to begin with and into the upi 1.0 2.0 so it has been a massive infrastructure put up on the payments infrastructure side uh coming back to now within the sme space uh where i guess uh, the challenges are multifold 
it's it's just not the payment there right there is a lot of uh, process even before the payment gets initiated so there is a complete procure to pay cycle uh, where there are purchase orders traveling between one sme to another sme between the brand and the distributor there are performa invoices traveling there are invoices traveling there is a connection with the gst servers and so and so forth so there are multiple parties right i mean they are all today if we see they are all sitting on the islands they are all operating in silos uh, some of the tools have started connecting selectively one uh, so let's say the tallies and the quickbooks of the world do connect with the gst servers but now to be able to build something similar as we have on the payment side within the sme space i guess the very first thing which has to happen is a network effect on the existing infrastructure within the sme landscape and within the sme landscape what i mean with the existing infrastructure is their existing erp invoicing accounting engines they should talk to each other right. idly speaking uh, you know if there is tally in india today and 2 million subscribers use tally 2 million smes use tally in india idly speaking i would imagine these 2 million users of tally are able to talk to each other exchange ledgers digital ledgers between each other seamlessly and that would have been a great network effect for these 2 million people but unfortunately it isn't the case but now also the reality is that out of 51 million smes uh, for an example if we pick assume 40 million of them use certain tools they do not use all of them they do not use just tally alone so someone uses quickbooks someone is at microsoft someone is is with oracle zoho and so and so forth and these tools are never going to talk to each other so i guess the network effect within the sme space that we are looking at from the business that we are building right now is to build more like a network of ledgers where right. is something very similar to what has happened in the payment space that any tool any bank application can talk to anyone else on the other side is exactly what's to happen within the sme space when any tool on the sme side is able to talk to any other tool on the other side of the sme and that's the origination of the transaction to begin with and i guess the payment piece uh, the way i see it is it's already sorted it's been evolved in india to a great degree we just need to ride on that piece so use upi use one of those existing protocols and the existing infrastructure on the financial side to ride yeah. on that to finish the end to end transaction so that's uh, essentially what our take on this opportunity within the sme b2b digitization space is uh, what hydro is building up right right and vishal you know follow up on that do you actually see uh, invoices getting kind of standardized uh, in a sense the formats i mean right now part of it is you know my sense is the way quickbooks and and tally and you know that that are used for invoice creation do you see you know some of the standardization happening yes i guess at least again within india if you look at it uh, ravin uh, there is uh, a new regulation which is in action right now uh, more so originated by the central government uh, wherein today the invoices from different tools were being created and they were being uh, submitted at the gst servers more so from the tax compliance and tax uh, uh, reporting standpoint right. but now from a standardization perspective what exactly is happening is all the different tools be it the tallies and the saps and the microsofts navisions and all of them they all will have to talk to the gst servers up front while creation of the invoice uh to get a invoice reference number from the central servers it is still more so from the tax compliance perspective wherein the whole tax gst calculation workflow will change but in some way i see that yes a piece of standardization will come through that every single tool will have to follow through those particular attributes and that data points in terms of you know the hsn codes and the skus and what all information needs to still go into the central servers but otherwise if you are looking at across various tools i mean different tools have different uh, nomenclature and different ways of doing invoicing different database schemas in terms of their design of their tools uh, so yeah so that's purely at a application level uh, but uh, the gst's initiative i feel that uh, is something which is moving us slowly towards the standardization piece 
Right, right, and it's interesting, you know, you know, companies like Hilo and and of course on the consumer, uh, you know, sense we've we've seen, uh, you know, Yelo and and you know also on the again more for startups we've seen Open Financial. We've seen a lot of these, um, I guess, open banks, right, that are kind of sitting on top of the banking infrastructure, right, mm-hmm. um, and and it's really interesting because they're they're all targeting different segments. Sure. Um, I would love love to see you know uh, you know hear from from you know the VC angle right. How do you mm-hmm. see this whole kind of revolution kind of playing out? Um, you know where 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 the you know you have banks at one end, then you have obviously the customers at the other. But in between, you know you actually have these open banks uh, in between. You know how how do you see these playing out in future? Okay, and I think uh, yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, as Vishal and Ram pointed before, right? I think there's opportunity. There's a huge opportunity in a in a B2B segment, really speaking, right? Be it for open banking or be it for applications which unify the communication between two uh, part, part, parties, right? And uh, as Vishal also pointed, these people come with some legacy system. So talk about any brand to retailer or let's say any uh, like a, a multi brand outlet with a particular uh, with set of brands, they they are typically coming to the digital world today with their existing platforms, and that's what creates a different challenge compared to what really happened in B two C segment. B two C segment didn't have that kind of a legacy. So, for example, Correct. me paying my chaiwala didn't have any kind of legacy. Both of us didn't have a legacy, so we just adopted these new apps and we just started afresh. So some of these legacy systems do add some challenges, but at the same time, there is a huge opportunity of unifying that entire pipe. So I do feel like uh, echoing the same thoughts, uh, what we heard before is there are a few set of opportunities. One definitely from a payment perspective between in the B2B segment, how do we take the B2B payments? And the B2B payments can be again divided into like micro payments. Like if let's say I'm a small retailer, I have these micro payments of let's say 150, 200 bucks kind of rupees given to smaller vendors, uh, which might have a different rail of uh, or different kind of a, a, a app itself or the play itself versus let's say a vendor uh, relationship where I might be paying on a monthly recurring basis, etc. There are certain products which are already created by NPC and some of the players as a platform rails, but we have not seen a lot of innovations as a from a venture perspective or a startup perspective on a B2C segment, trying to unify that. Thing. So unification of payments between B2B, that's a huge, huge, I would say, area. That's one. Second one is this fragmented ecosystems, right? As I said, like, these people come on the, uh, today they are coming to this payment world with their existing ecosystems. So either it's accounting ecosystem, their invoicing ecosystem, or there are mandates like GST, etc. So that, so there is a second group of, I would say, applications or uh, opportunities. In fact, I think something what Hilo possibly is also trying to do is unifying that entire uh, ERP connect or invoicing connect, unifying right. that entire plan. That's a second opportunity. The third, I think, definitely is a derived opportunity out of the first two. If I'm really doing this payment right, if I'm doing this uh, ERP connects right, maybe there is a huge new data which was not there with banks or any providers today, even with government for that matter. For example, government definitely do not know how much, let's say a small retailer paying to his, uh, like say day-to-day vendor, or maybe the employee who is working every day in his uh, shop as a kind of a uh, small guy who just get a cash cash out. So some of these things will become very interesting secondary innovation, uh, I think ground for, again, from a startup perspective, to leverage this for, I would say upsells and cross-sell opportunities, either the banks, either to the government, either to the data creation, even for the brands, because the brands do want to know what is the total turnover of this particular shop. I might have only exposure of, let's say, 10% of that shop's business, but whether it's 10% or not, the brand do not exist, do not understand. So I think with the three buckets, the payments and the entire open banking model infrastructure, uh, second one is uh, the uh, unification of the communication and the platforms, and third is definitely the data angle of it. That's, I would say, from an investor's perspective, and uh, no, uh, same things from my experience perspective. I, was, I do see the three buckets of opportunities right now. Right, right. No, no. Thank, thanks for that, 
for those perspectives. Yeah. In fact, and, and you Ravin, know, uh, Ravin, if you don't mind, just to add on top of uh, you know what Bhushan said, interesting ones, uh, just to link with you know a couple of experiences that we had on the ground, uh, especially with the banks and with a couple of brands that we're working right. with. So that whole data uh, piece that we are talking of, the, so this digital footprint today just does not exist in the B2B transaction space. And that is where the whole product or a service sell, cross sell, upsell that bank definitely wants to do. And that's the secondary derivative of the product sale that the banks would want to do to these SMEs is, is typically a long drawn cycle. Uh, you know, by the time the bank figures out that they can actually do an insurance or maybe a working capital lending to the guys, it's probably few weeks to few months by the time the approvals comes through. And typically the SMEs operate in a zone wherein they are looking for a working capital cycle or a rotation for like 20 days, 25 days. And by that time they're done, you know, so they need something which can come in like in 48, 72 hours. And then they can pay back this money in uh, next two weeks, three weeks and all. So this is mostly from the bank's perspective, what we have learned. Uh, interesting one that uh, on the brand side that also Bhushan pointed out. So we work with a couple of big brands today. And what we are learning there is uh, the secondary sales network visibility to the bigger brands is absolutely zero today. So for them, the whole sales visibility stops at the first anchor point, which typically happens to be the regional distribution network. So it's so a big uh, FMCG distributor or a big automotive spare parts distributor today would have, let's say, 500 or 800 distributors pan India. But then below them, there are tens of thousands of smaller sub dealers, traders, sub distributors, and so on. And banks so have no visibility to those guys. Banks have no visibility on that. Brands have no visibility on that. And this whole data availability as it comes through, I guess there is a lot for uh, both of them to get benefited out of them. Exactly. So I just wanted Correct. to share what we learned on the ground. No, thanks. I think this is great, right? I mean, the, 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 the fact that everybody benefits is, is, uh, it's very rare in ecosystem, right? Which actually brings me, you know, to my next point to actually Ram, right? Saying, you know, how should, you know, banks and fintechs collaborate, right? Today we're seeing, you know, multiple ways they're doing it. You know, there are investments happening from banks into these, you know, fintechs. Um, you know, they're obviously a source of money. But, but eventually uh, both, uh, you know, the quote-unquote open banks as well as the traditional banks, uh, need to benefit from this, right? Do you see any models that, that you know, if you look into the future that you think will play out? Uh, yeah, Ravin, it's like, you know, uh, we need to really have a paradigm shift, you know. I mean, you banks have now all realized that they cannot go and touch the last mile, the UI and UX part. So banks like ICICI Bank, they have already opened their APIs. Some other banks are also coming with that. All are waiting for some kind of guidelines coming from Reserve Bank of India. Because eventually you are touching a customer's money and particularly democratic countries like India. That is one of the piece. So what, what is my suggestion and why my humble uh, recommendations to the people who call themselves open bank? We need to understand the moment you become open bank, you should also understand that how to operate in a regulated environment. Where very the banks are also comfortable talking to you, you know, you know, it's it's it become very difficult, you know, because for your your mistakes, banks are penalized heavily, and that's why the marriage is not happening. So somewhere, you know, the good good kind of relationship is happens, and you also become a kind of uh, a, see uh, a, a kind of partner in their crime to the banks. Right. Then it is going to work very well. And talk about, I mean, I am telling you. The way this now the insurance is coming, you know, uh, the insurance is being sold with the help of SMEs. So good opportunities are coming. The only part is that with again, I'm selling that don't go with the existing products and services which is available in the market. Think a little bit differently. Why you are right. using UPI cash man the cash management transaction banking where they don't want the real time payments? It is expensive. You need, you can have any FT. Why you can't use any FT for merchant payment? Why you can't use a combination of NSCH and any FT or NSCH? It is cheaper. It is good. And you can get a proper reconciliation. Since I am coming from a digital background, I always talk about this leg. 
which is very important because unless until you have a seamless payment system it doesn't give you a complete value chain right and, and this the kind of sorry and yeah. this is something that you think open banks can kind of bring in right because if if in the end if you leave that decision to the end user it seems like a very complex decision right now to make this payment do i use neft to make this payment do i use upi right how does that become you know in some ways opaque to the end user right he should just say no. i want to make this payment sme sme doesn't have expertise they simply go to you say that i have already bought tally i can't now i have spent heavily can you give me something which works around tally and give me the allowance of my particularly my gst pay particularly my taxation particularly they can create my e invoices because without e invoices i cannot move the goods and services out of my offices so when as a part of open bank i i i always feel that open banking is a very broad term as right. a part of their partner you can do like this open banking means you become a bank the moment you say you become a bank then you create a kind of line for fighting no you simply say i am going bank i am you do the asset liability management remaining thing you take it from me in which way you want you can take that as a license enterprise license you can take as a revenue sharing you can take as a software as a service and i am going to it is seamlessly all your existing service provider and give you a complete end to end solution because as the technology is evolving and i'm telling you guys upi is a redundant now after after 6 7 months after covid is open and have a better services than upi right because it's 6 years you know when i was doing imps imps was the best but then i had a messaging platform mm -hmm. protocol problem and that's why I created upi so now the the neft is better because it works on sml so that exactly what i'm trying to say that as a fintech you should take the best of the world and go to your client and give him the best of world that's it and there you your expertise is there correct correct and that's interesting right so, but but having said this you know if the banks are going to sit continue to make money just through you know what you say you know the asset kind of asset and liability uh, model right uh, how do they eventually they are not making money they are not they are not making money Uh, see, because of see the kind of NPs are happening, it's null and void. The only part is that they've been forced to finance them, like SIDB. SIDB only does the asset liability. They give the loan and forget the mudra loan. Now beyond that, nobody is going and tell the SME that how are you going to manage this much money and what are the tools available. And if you go and tell them I am providing this tool, they will love it. Fifty-one right. million is a good opportunity. Five point six. Six billion dollar opportunity. This is a report from, from Venture Intelligence. This is the latest report coming out. Wow, after are, this COVID, uh, after this COVID, the VCs are going after you guys because they have to invest somewhere. Right, all right. And and Bushan, so did you do you kind of echo that? Because one of the things you know, I'm sure you know, you are seeing it. We're all seeing is you know, open banks are. you know customers love them you know banks seem to like them but eventually they just don't seem to be making money right how do how do you see this playing out and is this you know given the post covid world we believe is going to become a little more rational and people are going to look at people you know companies that are making money right mm -hmm. how does how how you know how how does open banking you know still you know or neo bank what are it's called still mm -hmm. you know remain hot because where are they going to make money mm -hmm. and it's an interesting question i think and we have not really answered this question so far uh, that how open banks would make money but again as a from an investor perspective we are not investing in today's story we are expecting investing maybe the story which will be over let's say 3 to 5 years of time and how do we possibly make money so maybe I'll touch upon maybe the aspect of open banking and your banking itself first what really is happening and why that marriage is possible what ram was connecting is so today the banks if you if you look at their infrastructure who holds the license to run the banking who holds the kind of regulatory uh, understanding who all that legacy entire ecosystem of kyc and everything right but what really banks have banks could not do they could not get their banking to the context of the transaction so what really means is for even from the consumer perspective when So five year back when we go to bank to take a loan, the bank doesn't even know that this guy is going to take this personal loan and use for what, right? 
Same okay. thing happened on SMB side also. Its banks could not go to a transaction level. So, like, if I give an example, like for example, today, many more loans are done at a pause point of sale, right? Maybe I'm buying something on an online shopping site. I take a quick EMI loan, right? And I mean, so all these micro loans phenomena really came in, which is in the context of the transaction, which right. uh, and same thing will happen in B two B also. Really speaking, for example, if I have invoice in hand. Maybe I need the invoice discounting at that time. That I don't need to fill a form and go to a bank, and so there is a disconnected phenomena which banks could not handle. And I think that's one big opportunity for uh, of pockets, right? Who holds what, right? The banks are still more of an infrastructure of financial ecosystem, financial supply chain, but they need vehicles like Open Bank and New Bank to take this entire infrastructure and put in a context of an invoice, of a payment to go happen. Of a credit line be open of thirty days between, let's say, a bank and a retailer, etc. So I think they have a definite value in the ecosystem of taking this entire infrastructure uh, to the relevant context where these two businesses are transacting or a business is transacting within themselves, right? So I think that's one big opportunity in what what their areas of I would say targets uh, product, uh, build up would happen from a new banking perspective. And now, if I think uh, what we said, few a few of the pointers which we heard earlier is from all the panel here, is there's a money of money from creating that value to the e retailer. So I think the first pocket of right. money possibly can also come from because you get got an interconnected ecosystem of payments, invoicing, everything for that SME, which earlier was not possible. There's a money to be made as a service fee for sale. The second one is the Entire bank, which was sitting as an infrastructure waiting for customer consumer to come, they will find a new uh, pie of uh, money transactions happening because the users really put the banking in a context, right? So, uh, and same happened with e-commerce and the uh, online uh, loans, etc. Or credit card, which actually happened, uh, I can convert my credit card into cash, etc. Same thing would happen in a possibly banking ecosystem. The entire pie, what this X bank was kind of working with their existing customers, or the new customers from a new banking perspective. So the the new customer acquisition for a bank definitely is a money for new bank because otherwise the bank has to spend a lot of money. Any new loans, any new kind of products uh, offered, insurance is offered from a banking ecosystem, or the traditional ecosystem through the use case connected uh, models of these new apps. Definitely the second pocket of money. And a third, definitely, which one which talk about, I think the new pocket of money which will come from the entire data. Again, going back to the brand and the banking right. and the entire story, what we talked about. I think there are definitely three pockets of money today. Maybe we 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 see most of the early stage companies are in a growth stage because all these monies cannot be possible if you have only few thousand customers. So maybe these people have to kind of go beyond a critical mass of uh, customers. And then you can demand these monies either from banks, either from consumers, as well as from the data pockets. And these are three right. definite pockets of monies which can definitely be made. And they have their own niches. The bank will hold infrastructure, and then possibly new banks will hold consumers better because they are putting the use case uh, and the finances together. And that's 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 what I would say uh, as a, how the how the ecosystem would play from an economics perspective. Very very interesting, right? Um, and and I wonder how that. You know that plays into your decision making of who to fund, right? Given that it's fairly clear that you know companies need to raise a lot of money before they can even make any money, right? Given that the, the scale they require and the number of customers they have to reach, um, mm -hmm. so eventually it does become. Uh, though it's clear where they can make money, it becomes interesting to see whether they need to raise that much money or they partner with banks that really can help them, you know, take them to uh, a large set of SMEs because of the product. The uh, offering that they have, exactly, and I think right. that's that's uh, yes, and, and that's the virality aspect. And we have seen some of the applications today, right? Because the niche nobody has gone into that area right now and created value. So there's a huge opportunity, virality, distributions possible. Like go to a brand, brand anyway, as Vishal pointed, right? Some of the brands which we possibly have, have like thousands of outlet connected, but nobody has given solutions to that. So I think there are some smarter ways of distributing the businesses what you build uh, in this segment. Possibly can create a quicker value, uh, and and given that they are few and then they are very niche, it's easier to connect. 
uh, than consumers because consumer there was no thread which was connecting before. At least here we have got ERPs, banks connected. Uh, so easier possible from a customer acquisition perspective is what I feel. Right, right. And uh, Vishal Ram, do you all kind of echo these thoughts? How do, how do you all think about you know these making money? Right, Vishal, there's probably something on top of your mind. Anyway. See, Bhushan, I totally agree uh, with you, whatever you have said. You know, when, when I started, you know, UPI, we started with a million transactions in a, in a month and on a charging 50 paisa as a switching fee. I told my people that I want to reduce it to 10 paisa. And they said, why? I said, I, I'm going to make more money when I'm, because I was targeting a billion transactions, you know, kind of situation. So today, million transaction, I make more money because see, you have to target kind of thing. You have to think little differently. The SME is a very big piece, you know, 51 million SMEs is a good source of your money. Only part is that instead of becoming a bank or pseudo bank or new bank, you simply say, I become a facilitator between your customer and a bank. So bank is going to don't don't go and say that I am going to fight it out. Simply say I am going to facilitate your payment and then you make more money. Because at the end of the day, the SME is having the full scale banking with the bank. He will not go out from the bank. Let's do Correct. the outside services and make money and you'll be happy because re regulations are very tight in India and you feel that uh, as a as a SME or as a fin uh, as a fintech you can be you can do the regulation part the cost of regulation is about two point one percent can you afford it can you right. afford an AML engine or KYC engine mm -hmm. on yourself no so just sit in periphery and try to get the bo best of from both the world. Correct. Yeah. yeah, and you're right because part of it is also trust, right? Where am I going to, who am I going to trust to hold my money? I mean, of course, I think the trust in banks is kind of going down with all the, you know, with what's happening with Yes Bank and stuff like that. But having said that, in general, I think the trust is still sitting with the bank. So in a sense, you're right. more comfortable, uh, the bank holding money, but you're more comfortable transacting potentially through uh, an interface that makes it, you know, easier. Yes. Right, so the data becomes critical. So, but but I, I love can play very vital role. Right, right, and I love Vishal's thoughts on you know on on you know how he's thinking of making money because I, I know you know when we were talking backstage, you did talk a little bit about a SaaS fee in addition to all of these. Right, would love to kind of um, you know hear your thoughts on how how you think about you know these mid layers making money. Sure, sure, Ravin. So, yeah, so I guess uh, picking up uh, from Ram and Bhushan, what they said, just a few pieces around it. Uh, so within the entrepreneur uh, mindset, especially from the fintechs, open bank, neo bank, whatever uh, we want to call ourselves. So there are typically these three different school of thoughts that we see on the ground. Right. So one is uh, from the Western world kinds, the kind of Revolut and the N26 uh, kinds, you know, the full blown digital banking licenses and they they basically stand parallel to the traditional banks with better UI UX, but a fully regulated entity by the central banks because they have acquired the license. Uh, second uh, is more through a sponsored bank uh, arrangement as we have in India today. We still call ourselves Neo Bank and uh, Open Banks, but we have a bank behind us with very tight integrations, collaborations uh, and underwriting everything for us. Uh, no direct regulation though, right, on the FinTech. And then, uh, you know, something which uh, uh, is also called as marketplace banking, you know, more like uh, linking back to the words any to any connect, right? Uh, connecting different uh, segments of SMEs from different verticals to different set of uh, ERPs or different set of banks and different kind of products and services, right? So every now each of these models have a different design uh, back of their mind, right? Someone is very specifically going out with a product. Someone is very specifically going after a specific segment of the customer. And someone like us is saying that we will go out for the SMEs, but now SMEs within the B2B distribution channel itself, right? While we say these are 50 million uh, SMEs out there, broadly, I can qualify them today maybe at 200, 300 different segments altogether who have different circumstances on their day-to-day -day business, right? Their needs are very different. 
the kind of banking products and the banking services that they need are also very different and one single bank or one single nbfc would not be able to cater to all of them so i the way we look at it is you know there would be multiple banks multiple products services coming through this whole uh, uh, gamut of universe would continue to stay uh, multiple erps on the sme side would continue to stay and that's where we strongly believe that someone like us who is basically a glue right a a network fabric a switching fabric uh, the way probably npci is i mean a very you know odd uh, comparison so to say that where npci is a glue and a fabric between the whole financial infrastructure in the country and connects all the banks together uh, something similar is what we are looking at hilo to be to begin with at the erp level and that's essentially we are looking at hilo's primary proposition and bushan rightly pointed out that that is something wherein if we can get this connected out there and the sme sees a value out of that one would be willing to pay and uh, the proof of the pudding is that yes today we are charging revenue on that and sme is paying on that right so what what essentially we are able to do we are able to have one sme's ERP E and e ERP A and ERP B. So surprisingly, you know, on the ground, we also figure out that under the same roof, within the same SME's office, there are more than one ERPs available. One ERP talks to the brand, and the other ERP talks to the value chain downwards, right? right. And these two ERPs do not talk to each other. So there is a lot of manual intervention, mistakes, and delays on the whole reconciliation process on his working capital, business, and so and so forth. so problem starts right there in the house then the problem is around the communication with the the value chain yeah. the disputes are arising because the ledgers do not match because on one side is tally talking other side is zoho someone while entering some manual data has made a mistake so these two ledgers do not match a, at any point in time and the dispute itself could throw your payments out by few weeks and that's basically the delay on the payments right that's the pain point that sme is going today through today in terms of the receivables and collections so this is the way we look at it is as the as the primary use case for us that we went after uh we went with a top down uh, approach from a go to market standpoint so that we touch one distributor and we have 200 smes of his on the network and 10 different erps on the network so with this approach we have been able to grow very quickly and see you know that yes we are solving certain problems so that is where something like from a monetization standpoint ravin saas fee kicks in and we yeah. are able to see depending upon the segments some segments at couple of 100 rupees and some segments at couple of 1000 rupees are willing to pay us those kind of saas fees just for this right. value addition right because uh, it is a replacement for their uh, in house person right in some sense at least they 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 look at it as as a as, as that that cost or not yeah you know yeah absolutely not only the in house person ravin it is also significant time consumption of the sme owner himself so typical businessman that we are talking right i mean it is the same guy who is busy with the the bank with the brand and also with the employees busy on collections payables rentals taxes so you name it right i mean the guy has 10 different transactions to do on a daily basis so his significant time goes into that which is most expensive which otherwise he can utilize more efficiently on the business side so yeah so very clearly i guess uh, uh, definitely i mean he does have the employees today uh, who are managing this so that's a direct cost one can uh, see through but the businessman's own cost is something which you definitely can't put value to right i mean that's probably 10 times of the employee cost right so that's the primary piece uh, and then of course linked with the primary piece itself is within the receivable transaction that we have been able to see is uh, connecting with the whole payments infrastructure right so now you have connected the erps you have been able to keep uh the whole relation between the supplier and the buyer is very transparent now uh with this kind of a hook and now the payments have to happen and on payments thankfully in india at least you have the whole highway av available to you so you pick up a upi api and you can actually enable the whole collect piece for the distributor and it could be all digital 
post covid i would imagine this uh, to just pick up significantly but over the past 2 3 years what we have seen is digital payments have grown from a single digit percent to good uh, higher side of 20% odds so 26 27% digital payments is what happens over the b2b segments today right. uh, and then within our own experience we saw that for the 6 months of existence that we have been in uh, on upi uh, and of course imps integrations done with multiple banks that we have done uh, we have been able to move roughly a million dollar a month on our platform of which good 30% money travels uh, digitally now which wasn't the case earlier so yeah so even on the digital payments we are in now the whole reconciliation happens real time on a platform right. like ours and right. we push that information back into the erp systems so that's another monetization point point for us right so these are like micro pain points which Absolutely. the sme is living through today and if we can save that guy's time around this the guy is actually willing to pay so these are my primary foundation monetization points once as a bhushan rightly pointed out that once we are through the journey for next 6 months one year with the same sme and we have few thousands of his transactions that's a good time for me to go to the brand and go to the bank and start looking at what cross sell upsell we can do with one bank or with five different banks depending upon the right. product portfolio that we are able to aggregate right i know this is such a big change you know uh, from from what we've seen right i mean the if, the assumption has always been the smes and micro smes are notoriously famous for not being you know not wanting to pay for products and services right and i'm hearing a completely different story which just shows how quickly india is india is changing right and and from what all of you have said it it's it's fairly clear that you know everyone you know in this ecosystem uh, benefits significantly uh, through these changes right whether it's the sme micro sme the banks the open banks in between right um, and 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 you know eventually the 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 vc uh, vc is too right um but you know I, i you know almost running out of time but just before we close would love to get you know uh, some final thoughts on three of you quickly on b2b payments ecosystem top three trends uh, that you see you know playing out in the next you know given the timelines are are, are so fast i would say in the next 12 18 months ram should we start with you <laughs> uh, again my thoughts are a little bit different i i feel that is going to be overization of the entire sme space in a b2b segment in a private blockchain and they will be needing a very cost effective seamless frictionless payments and the entire value chain you know people are willing to pay provided you go and get them and the good piece is that they can create a different way avenues for giving them funding against their transactions which will be cheaper than getting the funds against their stocks right that's my take the, the, the going is good only part is that how smartly we can take it right uberization of smes that will be interesting hopefully it doesn't go the uber way but but uh, <laughs> yeah uh, when you call it like a you know, whatsapp payment and uberization means my thought is like 400 million uh, customers or uh, people are there on the whatsapp platform and whatsapp is also coming with the enterprise app people are comfortable transacting and today they are doing the transaction tomorrow we just make it transaction plus something where vishal can play very vital role then then i don't think everybody will be happy Right. investors as, as i mean it's a win win situation for everybody how smartly you can take it that depends on the visit correct correct it looks like the market is ready to adopt it right given given you know uh, all the market other market is always ready you know in 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 indian uh, business community <laughs> they say when you make money with a smart uh, businessman making money in recession so post covid right. uh, the doors are open Like another six month down the line, all the SMEs, most of the people, they have lost faith in now uh, now the cash. Now the com- RBI is coming out with a digital currency, and private cloud blockchain is coming. I think you can do the wonders. Yeah, that's a uh, that we would love to kind of see how this plays out. But sounds really really interesting. 
Bhushan, how do you see this playing out over the next yeah, 12 months? I think, yeah, 12 to 18 months, definitely. Maybe I'll take one each from all the uh, pillars, key pillars. One definitely is government. Uh, I think uh, uh, we would see some kind of unification happening across uh, these rails, like UPI, um, and match mandates, and whatever we have seen in wallets, etc. I think that unification is required because today consumers have to understand that, oh, I have to send this 100 bucks, which rail I am going to use? Do I use this UPI app? Do I use a wallet app? Because it's almost like we are becoming half policymakers as consumers, right? So I think we, I do feel that uh, consumers would have an opaque view of all these rails and maybe the banking and the new banking is going to take care of it. So I, I would just say I want to pass the money. And somebody would have to figure out that this money can be efficiently passed through using UPI, NH, or whatever it is. I think that's right. one uh, interesting phenomenon if government can do, or it can be really big, big, big change from a uh, which will help the other two large ecosystems of the play. The second uh, we, uh, bucket I would feel is SMB itself. I think uh, the trend, what I see, especially I think taking COVID into account, is I think people, especially SMB, is the largest cost today. For them is people and how to sustain the people, right? Because salaries, etc., during the downtime. Right. So I think they will be more people efficient coming out of COVID. And what is people efficient is nothing but like, do I have a solution or a machine or a application which can solve this problem? So I think there's a natural inclination of these people to adopt new stuff which will create efficiency and effectiveness in their entire business. And I think if you talk about payment efficiencies, for example, I might have two people following up with my vendors. Uh, payables for receivables, etc. Can this kind of applications pay that way? We've seen already some applications like Hilo, there are a few other applications in the market right now. Uh, a couple of them are even on the portfolio today. They actually help this thing. So adoption of these uh, kind of applications which really bring in the money faster instead of like, for example, if I create an app which keeps nagging the guy who I have to receive from, I might pay faster. So maybe the money coming faster is the money, uh, uh, there's an additional possibility, at least if not anything interest I'm going to get. So I think the, if, that efficiency and effectiveness, which will play an important role. And I think COVID will kind of naturally kind of create a catalyst for adoption of new technologies. And we have seen already happening in education in some other sectors. Same thing would happen with uh, SMBs. And these are another natural factor which happens is basically today, a lot of the SMBs started receiving digital money from the consumers because of COVID. Yes. So it's very hard for a SMB today, like I received everything digitally and then I have to convert in a cash to pay to my vendor. So Correct. if the real is digital, digital, digital entire throughout, I, I, I can sit at home and operate my business. If people are still, even SMBs are today scared to go to ATM and take out the cash, forget the banks Correct. right now. So yeah. I think that's an interesting angle from an SMB perspective and what is that, why that adoption will be higher. And third, I think from a, I would say, uh, more from a startup ecosystem perspective also. I think leveraging yeah. the policy, etc. I think I, I do feel the startups, uh, uh, because consumers uh, are a little bit scared of uh, physical goods coming to their home, etc. So start, I would I do see that is a natural kind of a lever for startups to also start thinking from B2B perspective. For two reasons. One is because the two first two factors, they might have a natural niche of uh, innovations and gap, etc. to kind of thrive there. But also, the, for example, if I have to collect, let's say, 100,000 rupees or 1 lakh rupees from, from my digital payment solution on a consumer economy, I might have to acquire hundreds of customers, look at them. Whereas in SMB, I might be happy right. just doing one SMB. So the right. volume of money would be much higher in B2B segment. So that's why I feel the startup, from a startup ecosystem perspective, I see there are a lot of catalysts which will be available in the next 12 to 18 months. From an SMB perspective, leveraging the runtime at the same time, uh, not just the time, but the natural indication of SMBs to adopt this solution because of the what they will come out as a consumers after, let's say, six to eight months after COVID. And right. then key, I, would, I would kind of put it. Beautiful, beautiful. Thanks, thanks, Bhushan. Vishal, final thoughts? Yeah, I guess uh, Ram uh, Bhushan covered it uh, all, more or less. Uh, uh, <laughs> Very clearly, I guess uh, digital payments is something that we definitely see. I mean, even pre-COVID, I mean, the way we were looking at the market, uh, the whole B2B landscape, uh, massive opportunity. And we were seeing the uptake, uh, though selectively, as much as the market is open. But uh, segment by segment, we were seeing people getting very open to the idea of, uh, 
you know, adopting the whole digital ecosystem uh, within the B2B space because end of the day, I mean, the SMB end of the day is a guy like me and you who actually is using the QR code at the Chaiwala, who is using uh, wallet at a uh, payment uh, to as a payment tool at some other movie theater or something, right? So exposure to the whole financial ecosystem has been massive. And these guys continue to wonder that why do they run their own distribution shop or their dealership in a such a mundane way, right? Why can't we have something like this? So they, there have been a lot of ideas coming through, just not from the tier one cities, but tier two, tier three cities where we have been meeting the dealers and distributors. So clearly, I guess digital adoption, pre-COVID, post-COVID, uh, I, I would say this is happening for sure. So that's what I see 12 to 18 months window within the B2B space. Uh, other piece, more so again, uh, from the experience on the ground, uh, working with banks as our partners, a uh, lot of banks opening up their APIs uh, to integrate now. Uh, we, we see that uh, the whole compliance, the KYC adoption, uh, getting uh, the fintechs to act in a more regulated way while we are not regulated today. So we are being asked to follow the processes, the whole onboarding right. compliance very close to the bank. So that is something which I would expect in the next 12 to 18 months, linking it back to Bhushan's, uh, you know, government uh, or the regulatory aspect, that that is something that we foresee coming in very soon. And okay. probably another piece is uh, that we again keep hearing from the market and from the banks on either side of our ecosystem is the data privacy and security. So we expect okay. that uh, something big to happen within this space again in the 12 to 18 months, purely from a definition standpoint. And probably what would uh, request Ram again uh, sometime in the coming weeks to enlighten us and maybe do another session around the data privacy and the security aspect uh, uh, for benefit of all the fellow entrepreneurs. So it would be nice to hear Ram. Uh, but yeah, I guess these, these are the areas which we see, which uh, as an entrepreneur, as a startup, uh, uh, while it's an opportunity, we have significant work to do in these areas to set our business right and set, set our platforms and shops in place. Lovely, lovely. Guys, three of you, thank you so much. And I think, you know, some of the key things that have come out here is one, I think clearly resounding from all of you is that B2B is, is clearly a large opportunity and opportunity because the market is, is ready. Uh, one, you know, kind of uberization of, I think, access to credit itself. You know, uh, you know, kind of rest of that. I think that sounds like a, you know, really promising play. The second thing is, of course, I think you know what Bosham brought up really critical. You know, you get paid digitally. Uh, you know, why don't you know why can't I continue that that whole chain? You know, going down digitally. And third, I think operationally for anyone who's in you know who's in the open banking space to really start very very seriously thinking about what it means to be uh, regulated, right? And and and, and start kind of planning for that, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, regulation on data privacy or whether it's regulation on how you store data, all of that, right? So would be, would, you know, definitely be, um, we would love to hear other entrepreneurs how they're planning for it. And maybe that's another session we should do along with, you know, data privacy. But, but thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, we're almost down an hour, just time mm -hmm. flew. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ravin. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.